Distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, we shall maybe wait for a couple of seconds more in order to have all of the attendees online. Uh, distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Milan Kristic and I would like to wish you a warm welcome to the panel discussion U.S. Selections and Serbian Dilemmas. And uh, I would like to inform you that this discussion is uh, part of the project A Real Say on uh, Serbia-American Relations, which is jointly conducted by the Belgrade Center for Security Policy and Center for the Studies of the United States of America of the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade. This project is uh, supported by the funds of the Embassy of the United States of America in Serbia. At the very beginning, I would like to uh, invite the representatives of our hosts of uh, Belgrade Center for Security Policy and Faculty of Political Science uh, to make a short introductionary uh, remarks. Uh, and I would like to yield the floor to uh, Professor Dragan Arsimic, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Political Science and Director of the Center for Studies of the United States of America uh, for this short introductionary uh, remarks on the behalf of the Faculty of Political Science. Uh, Dean Simic, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Kristic. Thanks so much for your kind introduction in this panel. Highly esteemed Mr. Countryman, honorable representatives of the foreign embassies in Belgrade, as well as respected representatives of the international organizations in Belgrade, Your Excellency Ambassador Vujacic, dear Mr. Georgiev, dear Igor Bandu, distinguished participants of this important panel. Last but not least, dear our students, friends. Actually, I'm very pleased by having this opportunity to greet all of you on behalf of the Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Belgrade, and as well as the Center for the Studies of the United States of America. As Milan put it, our faculty with Center for the Studies of the United States of America is a partner institution in this important project, which is supported by the U.S. Embassy in Belgrade. Actually, the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, our reliable partner for years. So uh, we consider, actually we feel, this is just a continuation of our long-term and uh, fruitful cooperation. To say that the idea for this project, entitled as openly on Serbian American relations, uh, as we are uh, agreed upon, we will discuss during this panel probably the turning points on international scene and raise and pose important questions in searching of answers on topics such as the U.S. presidential elections, Serbian-American relations, NATO-Serbia relations. And to say that converse and rethink has been always of critical importance and in any time. And this time, it is really important having in mind pandemic and unprecedented circumstances we are living in. In that regard, the topic of this panel, as already announced by, by Dr. Kristic, the U.S. elections and Serbian dilemmas poses, raises among the most relevant questions of today, having in mind that the presidential elections are due tomorrow, uh, the Tuesday next after the first Monday, the month of November. The United States of America, as we know, still are, according to many important parameters of state power, the most important, the most powerful country in the world. So to say that U.S. elections indeed are some sort of world elections. Serbia, to say Serbia, but of course I mean on, on public in Serbia, I mean on political cycles, I mean uh, on pundits in Serbia, with which the United States have almost 140 years of diplomatic relations, among which I can tell you that uh, maybe 90% we used to have very good relations we are war allies and uh, we are we were friends for many, many years and decades. Uh, we had this year, we celebrate 
uh, in December, actually, 100, uh, 140 years of diplomatic ties. And uh, having all this in mind, it is not uh, natural to say that uh, there are so big interest in results of elections and possible consequences of these elections on the situation in the region of Western Balkans and consequences concerning tackling the uh, future of several American relations. Our distinguished panelists who are with us today, I am sure will give us deeper insights in these problems for many different angles. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And at the very end of my short introduction, short speech, thank you all very much for joining us on this online session. Of course, I'd be very happy, as probably most of you, that we have chance to, to work this, this job together uh, live with the faculty or some other place in Belgrade or anywhere in the world. But uh, having in mind the situation, of course, this is the only way we can do the job. Uh, I wish you a great panel and good luck and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, dear uh, Dean Simic, uh, for this great introduction to our today's uh, topic and to our today's panel discussion. And uh, I would now like to yield the floor uh, to the director of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy, uh, Mr. Igor Bandovic. Mr. Bandovic, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Milan. Uh, on behalf of the BCSP, I want to thank you all for joining today's discussion. Uh, we are very happy to start of this project in a very exciting uh, week, primarily for the US, but I think generally very exciting times for the development of US-Serbia relations, having in mind recent developments. I think the purpose of this project is twofold. Firstly, it aims to look honestly at the state of the affairs of the relationship between the United States and Serbia through discussion with the experts on the subject, and on the other side to really inform and educate interested public on the status and perspectives of this re relationship. Uh, when I say interested public, we especially had in mind um, uh, students of the Faculty of Political Science of the University of Belgrade. And um, I think, they can learn and also engage with our experts, which was the idea behind the project. And I especially want to thank Dean Dragan Simic who accepted to join this project and this partnership with uh, BCSP. Uh, furthermore, I want to thank US Embassy uh, for recognizing the importance of this project coming uh, and uh, 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 really uh, developing it now uh, for the support for the project, but also for very useful inputs when it comes to the design of the topics and also identifying the experts coming from the US. Finally, I want to thank our panelists today for accepting invitation to talk. And uh, on behalf of the BCSP, I uh, really wish you a successful event. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bandovic. And uh, as you have mentioned, and as Dean Simic has mentioned, uh, today's discussion is just uh, one of the activities at the project, uh, which is called uh, Real Say on Serbian-American Relations, and which aims to create some sort of uh, safe space for uh, open and evidence-based discussion about all aspects of the US-Serbian relations and to increase the general public and uh, decision makers and opinion makers uh, awareness of this subject and their knowledge about this subject. Uh, besides public discussion, I would just like to emphasize that for the students which are currently attending this discussion, that one of the activities at the project will be a student competition for the best short story about Serbian US relations uh, and the uh, call for uh, applications for the competition will be announced in the first months of 2021 so students get ready because you can get some nice awards if you uh, win one of the first three places at uh, this competition. Uh, today we will uh, discuss uh, how will the outcome of the US elections affect Serbia as well as the US uh, Serbian relations. And uh, this topic seems to be very present and very popular in Serbian public discourse and in discussions in media 
uh, in Serbia in these days. And uh, it is my exceptional pleasure and honor to have an opportunity to discuss this topic uh, with our today's distinguished panelists. Um, our first panelist is uh, Mr. Thomas Countryman. He is the chair of the Arms Control Association Board of Directors. And he uh, has this position since October 2017. Mr. Countryman was acting under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, and he served for 35 years uh, in the US uh, Foreign Service until January 2017. Uh, he simultaneously served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation, a position which he held since uh, September 2011. Mr. Countryman is an expert in an expert for our region, actually, and uh, his first diplomatic post was in Belgrade during the 1980s, and he also worked at, uh, the, in the State Department's office for Eastern European and Yugoslav affairs uh, during the 1980s. Uh, our second distinguished panelist is Professor Ivan Vujicic. <clears throat> Professor Vujicic is a full professor at the Faculty of Economics, University of Belgrade, and at the Faculty of Political Science of University of Belgrade. Professor Vujicic was uh, the ambassador of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro, and the Republic of Serbia to the United States of America from 2002 to 2009. Uh, Professor Vujicic is among the leading experts in the field of the US-Serbian relations. <clears throat> And uh, our third uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Slobodan Georgiev. Um, Mr. Georgiev is an investigative journalist from Belgrade. Uh, he works for weekly magazine Vreme since uh, 2001. And from 2007, he is a member part of the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, BIRN, uh, in which he is also a program coordinator. Uh, this year, Mr. Georgiev became a director of news and program of the TV channel uh, Newsmax. Adria, which started broadcasting its news recently, a couple of uh, months ago. So uh, since we have only one hour and 15 minutes for this discussion, uh, I do not want to bother you anymore with any introduction from my side, but I would just like to mention one important technical details for all of the attendees. So you can ask questions which you would like to ask using the Q&A option at the Zoom webinar. And uh, we will uh, take these questions into account and we will answer some of them uh, at, during the last part of our today's panel discussion. So uh, before the end in last 15 minutes or something, but feel free to ask during the conversation and we will address these questions at the end. So to start with uh, our today's topic, I would like firstly to ask one general question to all, all of our panelists. Um, the US presidential election 2020 has been receiving much attention in the Serbian public. So is uh, the outcome of this year's elections substantially relevant for Serbia? And uh, what might change and what will remain the same in the US-Serbian relations and for Serbia, generally speaking, after tomorrow's election? Uh, Mr. Countryman, I would like to yield the floor firstly to you. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Hvala Milane, baš mi je drago. Ja bih rađi bio sa vama u Beogradu. But we are a little bit busy here. Uh, and right after this call, I'll be driving 200 kilometers up to Pennsylvania to knock on doors this afternoon and to be an election site observer tomorrow. I will answer your question about what the election might mean for the Western Balkans. But I wanted to give <clears throat> your, the listeners today a little bit of context for the American elections uh, and why it is the most important election in American history. Uh, this election is marked by a massive campaign of cheating by one of the parties, unprecedented in American history. Cheating is not unprecedented, but organized cheating by one of the major parties on this scale is absolutely without precedent. As the OSCE says, uh, elections should be free, fair, respected, and safe. They should be free of any interference or intimidation of voters. They should be transparent with votes counted by people who are not partisan. 
they should be respected in the sense that whoever loses promises to accept the results and they should be safe, conducted in an atmosphere that takes into account the current pandemic <clears throat> and that is free from the threats of violence. Unfortunately, the Republican Party is unquestioningly following the president in challenging every one of those normal standards of a free election. Now, some of the tactics they are using are not unheard of in elections in the Western Balkans. Uh, but to me, it is depressing that at a time when the Western Balkan states are moving some faster, some slower towards 21st century standards of Europe, the United States is moving backwards to 20th century Balkan standards. I wanted to also say just a word about the role of uh, voters in the United States and particularly Serbian American voters. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind the numbers. The US is almost 340 million people. There are 260 million people eligible to vote and we expect that this year we'll see the highest percentage of participation of voting that we have seen in the United States in more than 100 years. That's how high the interest is. Uh, so you can expect that there are nearly 200 million votes. Now, uh, Serbian Americans are more than 300,000, probably more than 400,000 in this country, and probably of those about 40,000 born outside the US. And they're concentrated in some key states, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. To put it in perspective, there are more than 200,000 Albanian Americans, about half of whom were born outside the United States in somewhere in the Balkans and about 200,000 who identify as Bosnian Americans, uh, many of whom born in the former Yugoslavia. Now, none of these numbers are precise. The US does not measure these in the same way that some other countries do. But the point is that it would have to be a very close election for Serbian Americans to be a deciding factor. For example, their concentration in Michigan, if Michigan turns out to be the crucial state that tips the total electoral votes one way or another, that could be significant. But I think that is rather unlikely. And I also wanna emphasize that ethnicity does not determine how a voter looks at it. I have two sons, they can call themselves Serbian American, Croatian American, Swedish American, and Irish American, if they chose to. They don't cho choose to, and none of those ethnic identities has anything to do with the way that they look at politics and the way that they'll vote. So don't assume <clears throat> that this is a crucial issue. I know that many Serbian Americans will continue to dislike uh, Vice President Biden because of his role as a Senator supporting the Clinton administration's actions in uh, Kosovo and elsewhere in the 1990s. And I know many Albanian Americans will like him for some of the same reasons. Uh, that is understandable. Uh, but I think that that is historical and not a good measure of what we can expect in the future. So uh, to talk about the difference between the two candidates and how that might affect the Balkans. First, it's important to understand that as much as people in Serbia may be thinking about this election and may be thinking about Donald Trump, let me assure you, he's not thinking about you. Don't feel bad about this. Uh, you are forced to think about Donald Trump when he doesn't think about you, but the same thing is true for ordinary Americans. We're forced to think about Donald Trump every day 
far more than he ever thinks about us. Uh, Trump has claimed that his September 4th action in the Oval Office, uh, inviting uh, Mr. Vucic and Mr. Hoti to sign interesting pieces of paper, ended a war. That's what he told a campaign rally last week, that he has stopped the bloodshed between Serbs and Albanians. Uh, I'm not sure that he knows what is in the agreement he signed, but it is important to understand the dynamics that led to September 4th. What is it about the Trump administration that brought about that day? Um, first, there is an obsession on the part of the president with making deals, making agreements. It is his claim to fame uh, and what he argued qualified him to be president. And so he has focused to the extent he focuses on reaching agreements with countries where new agreements are needed. Um, and that's how he sees the Balkans, not as a long-term security challenge, not as a place where human rights or economic growth must be promoted, but as a place where you can make a deal between competing sides. And in the way that this government operates, uh, every political appointee in the government who is beholden to Mr. Trump for their job has an assignment to do anything they can think of in order to improve the president's chance for reelection. And this is the motivation for Mr. Grinnell to have become so deeply involved so that as he hopes for a bigger job in a second Trump administration, he can say, I delivered one big foreign policy success. Now, whether Mr. Grinnell and Mr. Trump believe it to be a big foreign policy success or not is not the point. They hoped it would have an impact on the election. I think there's no reason to believe that it would have an impact on the election or that most American voters even noticed the event. <clears throat> Mr. Trump is also motivated by his disdain for the European Union so that he is happy to be in competition with the European Union in an area <clears throat> where there's a competition for influence among Brussels, Washington, Moscow, and Beijing. Uh, he doesn't side with the European Union in that. Instead, he looks at what economically he could bring in terms of reaching a deal and what it could mean economically to the United States. But I think the more important significance of the Trump administration for governments in the Western Balkans is the fact that any regime that is falling short of democratic standards has a good reason to prefer Mr. Trump to remain as president. In addition to the massive campaign of voter suppression that I already touched on, <clears throat> the United States has seen greater corruption in the high levels of the federal government than we've seen in our history for at least 100 years. We have seen in an unprecedented way the president utilizing every government department and ministry to advance his reelection agenda. We've seen constant attacks on the free press, on science, and on the very notion of factual reality coming from the president. And we've seen a determination to control and eliminate the independence of the judiciary and the prosecutorial field in the United States. Now, I don't want to compare any of the leaders in the Balkans to Mr. Trump, but uh, I think some of those leaders, including in Serbia, would find Mr. Trump's governing style to be more similar and more comfortable for their own style than they would find that of Joe Biden. So just a couple words about what might be different if Biden is elected. First of all, unlike Donald Trump, Joe Biden could find Serbia on a map. He knows where it is. He's been there repeatedly. 
The first time I met Joe Biden was in Sarajevo in 2001. And I saw him then and several times since speaking directly and frankly to presidents and prime ministers and foreign ministers from the Western Balkans. He has a style that is empathetic. He acknowledges how difficult the issues are, but he also speaks very directly about what the United States expects governments to do. He will be different in that he will not look on the Western Balkans as an arena of competition between the United States and the European Union. I think that you should expect to see a better coordination between the uh, two, uh, between Brussels and Washington on a Kosovo-Serbian dialogue. That does not mean a Kosovo-Serbia dialogue will succeed rapidly. The problem with the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue is not in Brussels, it's not in Washington, it's in Belgrade and it's in Pristina. But at least there will be a more rational basis to proceed. <clears throat> I think uh, one of the key things that will be different about a Biden administration is that after the experience of the last few years, uh, there will be a greater emphasis in the United States on fighting governmental corruption. And while the focus has to be on reforms we need here in the United States, this will also be a theme internationally, not just in the Balkans, but worldwide, arguing for greater transparency and a greater fight for the rule of law in every country around the world. Uh, since I believe corruption to be the number one issue in the Western Balkans, the primary issue that will continue to delay membership in the European Union, and that will continue to retard economic development in the region, I would welcome a greater focus on corruption. Note also what that means that the United States is not going to be in the same position as Russia or China in terms of offering payments under the table to leaders who approve their business contracts. Uh, it's illegal under US law. It may have been tolerated under the last four years. I will not be tolerated if it has ever happened under a Biden administration. So on the big question of what's better for Serbia, uh, the very short answer is for those citizens of Serbia who look forward to a democratic, uh, prosperous and non-corrupt future, I have no doubt that a Biden administration would be better. Uh, for those who are content with the th way things are, for those <clears throat> who would like to go back in history 50 years, as Mr. Trump would like to do in America, Mr. Trump would be the better choice. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Countryman, and uh, we will follow up on uh, your uh, on, on on your on on your thoughts uh, in the next round of questions. And I would now uh, like to yield the floor to uh, Professor Vujicic. Professor, the same question for you. So uh, why are uh, these year's elections in the United States so important for Serbia? And is it really important who will be the winner, Trump or Biden? And uh, how, what is better for Serbia, generally speaking? Professor Vujicic, please, the floor is well, yours. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, first of all, I have to say that I agree with a lot of what, what Tom said uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, in fact, uh, I was a little, he was, he was a little kind, uh, given this panel, I was a little more open and blunt about the influence, for example, of Serbs in America. Um, the only place that I saw a potential, a potential influence whatsoever was in Ohio. Uh, and uh, that had to do with a, a, a part of the Serbian diaspora there. But then, uh, back then, we had estimated that more or less, you know, maybe 50,000, 40,000 Serbs were, were or Serbian origin, people of Serbian origin who felt that Serbs were in Ohio. 
but they have 7.7 million registered voters. So uh, it's a drop in the ocean. And uh, this, this whole uh, illusion that this has somehow the Serbian diaspora is gonna affect the American election is highly, highly improbable, except like he said, in, in maybe a, a specific state where things get so close. So that's, that's I think number one that we have to know. So nobody's gonna owe Serbs anything in case Trump, Trump wins. It's, they're not gonna be the deciding factor in that. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of, of what has been said about uh, the difference between Trump and, and the preceding presidents uh, is the fundamental in the sense that, as, as has already been said here, it is a transactional president. He thinks it's making a business deal. So the problem when, when, you're, or when you're dealing in diplomacy and you're not in business is the following. Uh, you go and in business, you go and try to make a deal with somebody. And if you don't make a deal, you say, okay, goodbye. It was nice meeting you, go away. And you find somebody else to make a deal with you. But in diplomacy, you're always talking to the same people. So the actors don't change. I mean, Kim Jong-un of North Korea is gonna be there next year and the year after in as long as Trump is president, okay? So if you don't make a deal, uh, then it's a problem both for, for you and for him and the different expectations and things can turn sour. So uh, that's how diplomacy works. It prepares these things and as, as opposed to what Trump had been doing, he's just doing it on his own. And uh, sometimes I think uh, definitely uh, the, the, the State Department, which let's put it this way, should have some kind of input into, into foreign relations uh, was totally sidetracked. In, uh, during these years. Now that's very strange and different. And so were some other interagency uh, ways of making policy in the United States, like uh, different times, the Pentagon or the Treasury or whoever. So actually we were seeing a, a, a foreign policy run out of the White House uh, with ups and downs and contradictions. And that certainly didn't, didn't uh, help us uh, feel that we were in a, in a state where we're, the United States be, became in the minds of the world, a factor of instability as opposed to stability, which it has been trying to to uh, uh, to propose uh, to promote ever since the Second World War. Let's face it; I mean, the United States is a conservative country. Stability, according to how they define it, is is a large part of their ideal. You know, once things are set, let's work it within the the rules. Now, this whole transactions business also comes down to the Washington Agreement quote agreement, it's not an agreement, it was a statement actually by two parties done in front of the American president independently of each other. And uh, a lot of the things about that agreement had nothing to do with us, as Tom had already said. Uh, I found it a little uh, um, uh, funny uh, and amusing that basically we became a factor in Middle Eastern politics in Washington. I mean, the focus was on, is the embassy gonna to go to Jerusalem? Uh, now that, that was the, the deal with the Emirates of recognizing Israel, this and that, whatever. So the, this whole this whole thing that happened in the Oval Office somehow became a part of of a lobbying for the Israeli lobby vote. I, I would assume to a large extent. Aside of saying, well, I'm getting the Nobel Prize, which is another thing he said that that uh, Tom forgot to mention. I'm getting the Nobel Prize for for peace in in the Balkans. So uh, this was all a function of of basically his his own own, own policy. Now. What is going to be different? Well, the difference is, is uh, as, as has already been said in a different way, is that first of all, uh, Biden is going to try to build back the partnership with the European Union. That's number one. And, and the Munich conference the other year when he came over there, he said, we shall be back. And he got a big applause from the prime ministers and or Europeans and the, and the chancellors and whoever was there. So uh, basically the Europeans, I think mostly, or at least in core European states, what I'm talking about, the, the, the what we still call the old Europe or the original 15 states, I think most of them are, are praying that Joe Biden gets elected because they felt very insecure with Trump for various various reasons and felt that they were uh, sort of, that this partnership was having a big rift uh, in this long, long partnership, not just through NATO, but just through, through, through the whole history of the United States and Europe. So uh, you're going to see that, which basically then translates into uh, Biden supporting what uh, would be the old 
senior, the senior Bush doctrine of, or that's how it's portrayed here anyway, of Europe free at peace and whole. And that means basically uh, promoting uh, EU accession to the Western Balkans for all those countries that are meeting the standards and continuing down their road of reform to be eligible members for the European Union. So that would find a lot of support like, like, like it did before Trump, Trump uh, took office. So this is what you're gonna be seeing, which then translates into, into uh, the Kosovo issue and Pristina and Belgrade. And I would assume with the plenty of stuff that, that Biden and the administration is gonna have on its plate, given the circumstances, and if he assumes office on that day, he's going to find a lot of problems that are much more urgent than the Western Balkans, that basically they will get on the same, uh, <clears throat> same page with the European Union, most of the, uh, mostly, uh, uh, promote the dialogue to Brussels and play and play a role in the sense that uh, if push, push comes to shove, they will then probably use some influence, especially on the coastal Albanians where, they're, where they have uh, high credibility to come to some kind of a terms if it comes, comes to, to a very close deal. So I would assume that this will, will happen. Uh, so the whole deal that be, of, of, and the talk of, of Tachi and Vucic making a, a, a territorial swap that was actually uh, on the somehow in the works, or at least partly in the works uh, during the Trump administration would just go away. And uh, although they have denied it, uh, we know it from John Bolton's book that actually this came up and certainly John Bolton uh, is a man who who's sitting, uh, actually Tom was uh, under secretary that I think Bolton, when I, was, when I was there, Bolton was there, I had a couple of meetings with him and then he moved to the UN. But after he got out of the UN, uh, Bolton was against, as, as opposed to the Co uh, Kosovo independence openly, uh, uh, publicly. And I think there was this transactions idea that under Bolton, these things could work out. Well, man, first of all, Bolton's gone. And secondly, if Biden gets elected, that's all going to be out of the window. So, so all this stuff is not going to, uh, to happen anymore. Or, or now, <clears throat> what uh, does that mean uh, for Serbia? Actually, it will mean, uh, I think the American side will basically try to, try to push, as I said, in, in, in terms of this doctrine, the European agenda, saying, look, we'll back you up. We're backing up the Europeans. You should get in the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> So I think this is going to be the, the, the track of American policy like it used to be before this happened. Now, a lot of uh, uh, the programs that we, we've managed to, to uh, install during, during after 2000 are going to stay in place, thankfully, uh, like the, uh, the relationship with the Ohio National Guard, like uh, uh, all the other stuff that has been done that is basically irreversible in the sense, uh, unless some very bad things happen. But I don't think we're going to be very high. And I think this is sometimes that a problem with all of us in Serbia is that we are living in an illusion uh, that we're still in Tito's time. That we're somehow at a crux in, in the border of NATO and, and the Warsaw Pact, that we're very important, that we're in Europe, or a large country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, non-aligned, this and that, all of that is gone. All of that is gone. So we're not going to be very high on, 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 on the agenda. In fact, I don't think we're really going to be high on the president's agenda. The only reason we can become on the president's agenda is like Tom said, he knows us. And he's been to Kosovo. Incidentally, I have to tell you this. Uh, in 2004, when, when there was the, the, the riots and against the Serbs and the burning of the monasteries, Biden was very, very upset. I saw him. There. Okay. He's very upset. He cares about Dechoni. He cares about uh, Father Sava. He knows these people. And he was very, very disturbed. So I don't think the interpretation here that the uh, Albanians were going to get away with murder because Biden was up there with Clinton uh, is going to is going to have any traction with with is going to have any relevance to the Biden administration. On the contrary, I think Biden Biden is going to care about these things more probably than some others uh, about the issue of the monasteries, about issue of human rights in, of the Serbs and the minorities in Kosovo. I think that's that's going to be an important part of that game. So. <clears throat> Let me try to wind up here with uh, by saying that uh, that there's no reason for us to to be uh, 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 skeptical about a big change in American policy, except for the transaction business. That's that is that is gone already. Even 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 uh, even before before this election, this was already off the plate by the, and was put off the plate, shoved off the plate by the Europeans in a very. Uh, 
how should I say, intrusive kind of way once they saw what, what, what Trump was doing. And uh, so we're going to back to where we were in this respect. Now, all things in the world are not going to go back. There's not going to be a perfect restoration to what was before for other reasons, but this is not part of the, uh, this is not part of the panel. The other thing that was going to affect us, I think is going to stay with us, is uh, <clears throat> the technological war between China and the United States. I think that's going to be stay on, that's going to stay an issue in America. The embassy in Jerusalem, I don't think that's going to happen if Biden gets elected because it's going to go with the, he's going to go with the European Union. They're opposed to it. Uh, the energy thing is nice on paper, but basically there's no alternative to Russian energy so far at this point or, or very or in the in the in the mid future. Okay, so that's going to go down. But the technological uh, uh, problem be between the U.S. and China is going to translate into Europe. It's going to translate into us. That's another thing I think that's going to to affect us. So all in all. <clears throat> it will affect us it will have to affect the whole world just as trump has so when we're part of the world thank goodness we're not sanctioned and put out a pariah on the world like we were in the new Orleans days so whatever affects the world is going to really uh, affect us and i think it's going to affect us in this way that i, I described okay thank you i don't want to to i would really feel that, that some other should get there to send Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Vujicic. And uh, I would now like to yield the floor to Mr. Georgiev. Uh, so, Mr. Georgiev, uh, how would you evaluate the progress in the U.S.-Serbian relations achieved during the mandate of the, of the President Trump? And how important is the fact that uh, Serbian representatives, to a certain extent, participated by the signing of the agreement, which has uh, mentioned Mr. Vujicic, it's not actually an agreement, it's a paper, right, in the White House. They participated uh, informally in the Trump's campaign. Uh, could it be a mistake in the case if Biden wins uh, or not? And uh, what is your impression about how will uh, the, the outcome of the elections affect the U.S.-Serbian relations and Serbia as such? The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello to everyone. Uh, uh, Mr. Councilman and, and Professor Bujic already said everything. You know, I, I just can add something um, uh, in that sense, saying that I think that uh, uh, our our president wanted to show that uh, he is good uh, with both sides. Actually, so we we know that he hosted Mr. Biden in 2016 here in in uh, uh, Serbia, he actually organized some program here in Belgrade for, for him and, 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 uh, and he, he spent the whole September uh, uh, talking about this huge thing in Washington, huge thing in, in, in White House, uh, uh, wanted to show that uh, Serbia is on a big stage and that he is the man uh, uh, who can actually in one week meet with uh, Mr. Trump, with uh, talk to Mr. Putin, talk to Mr. Xi in China, talk to Mr. Orban, talk to Mr. Erdogan in Turkey. So he's a very important guy. And I think that the, the, the whole thing about that uh, uh, event in Washington was focused on, on, on that, to, to show to the Serbian public that we don't have, we, we actually don't have better men for, for that job. And what is going to happen after, after uh, tomorrow, after these, these, these elections, I think that uh, the, the government in Serbia will say, you know, it's a good thing for us if Biden wins or if, if Mr. Trump wins. If Mr. Biden wins, that's it. We were friends with, with, with him, you know, from the early days. Uh, we as a progressive party uh, actually had a very good relationship with the U.S administration uh, in the period where we were formed. So if we remember in, in 2009, 2010, a very active uh, was uh, people from US administration in, in that period when the uh, Progressive Party was form, formed here in, in Serbia. They, they had their role. They organized uh, the, the visit of Mr. Vucic uh, to Washington you know, to explain what he's planning to do if, if he came to power uh, uh, sometimes. So I think that, that that's, the, that's the whole thing, you know, uh, whatever, it, whatever happens in, in, in the US, uh, our government uh, will say, it's a very good thing for us. If Mr. Trump wins, you saw, we are friends with them. I, I was in the Oval Cabinet as, as, as first Serbian president ever in history. 
So I'm, I'm very close to this guy. We, we're going to make this deal and fix everything that is, that is necessary. I think that uh, from uh, our perspective, from the perspective of citizens, uh, we would like to have, you know, uh, in Washington, somebody who can maybe talk sometimes about some values, some democratic values. I think that this is something that, that has been lost the last couple of years that, that we, we didn't hear uh, nothing uh, uh, from that side in that sense. You know? So uh, for, for the people in Serbia and for the people in, in all West Balkans and in Europe, US was a symbol of democracy. It was a symbol of, 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 of freedom, especially for, for the journalists. You know, you know when, when we quote, when we see, what, what are we doing? You know, uh, uh, our role models are, are, are you know, press from the US and the, and the role of the press and the role of the media from the US. But uh, that thing has been lost in the in, in last couple of years, maybe, maybe longer, you know, since actually US became, uh, actually put, they put uh, stability uh, uh, in front of everything, you know, in front of uh, democracy also. So it was not a story about democracy. It was not a story about uh, freedom. It was a story about stability. So if you want stability, you will have, you know, strong leader, uh, leaders all around the world uh, who can actually deliver uh, stability. That, that, that is one thing. And, and the other thing I wanted to, to stress in terms of um, this whole Kosovo issue and uh, relationship between US administration and, and EU. I don't have any, uh, uh, any sources, you know, from White House or from, uh, from Brussels or Berlin who can actually uh, prove that. But uh, uh, I think that they also, they work together. You know, maybe it's not, it's not like uh, in, in Obama time, you know, when he was a, a hero in Berlin, you know, he was, he was uh, hosted in Berlin like a rock star. Uh, Mr. Trump is not in that position, but I think that in, in that process of uh, 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 Kosovo-related uh, issues, Serbia-Kosovo-related issues, I think that uh, this uh, agreement or whatever we call it in, in, in Washington is actually a step forward, you know. I think that they, they, they press them to do anything, to do something. And we know uh, here in Serbia that uh, uh, without uh, without solving that issue with Kosovo, we will never be part of EU. So we can we can talk about rule of law, we can talk about uh, some other uh, problems, corruption, whatever. But we know that Serbia has this uh, 30, uh, uh, 35th uh, chapter in this negotiation process with EU and without uh, normalizing uh, whatever it means, things with Kosovo, we will never be part of, of EU. So if any single administration from Washington is, is uh, pushing that process forward, I think it's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. I don't know if it's, if it's real, if it's just, you know, Trump's propaganda, whatever, but, you know, this is something, you know. They, they actually uh, tried to move this process forward, and I think it's a very good thing. All, for Serbia and for Kosovo and for, for the whole region. Thank you very much, Mr. Georgiev. And uh, having in mind that we already have a number of uh, questions, uh, I think we might start with uh, answering those questions which we have received uh, through the Q&A option. Uh, I saw that uh, Mr. Countryman already uh, answered certain questions. Uh, he is already in a conversation with Mr. Stefan Dobrich about uh, Biden's uh, certain uh, speeches from the 1990s. So we will leave this question for the uh, written discussion and we will start with the other questions uh, which were posed. Uh, so the first one I would like to uh, read and to ask actually uh, Mr. Countryman to give us an answer. Um, Vladimir Tserovic asks uh, about uh, your 
uh, about about uh, those allegations of Mr. Countryman that the uh, Republican Party is making this election questionable. Uh, he asks if you can elaborate uh, this uh, this claim a bit more in details. And also another question for you um, in this first round of questions. Uh, one uh, colleague, Sasha Kulianin, uh, actually he questions. Uh, if the corruption is such an important thing for our citizens, which is as well, this, which might be uh, discussed, but that's not our today's topic. Uh, but the, the most important thing from his point of view is the Kosovo issue. And he thinks that the priority for Serbian national interest is to try to preserve the territorial integrity. So uh, why should then we look forward to Biden's election if uh, he will do, uh, if he will cooperate with the European Union more, more closely? How will that be better in terms of, uh, of Serbia regarding the Kosovo uh, issue? So that is, that is the second question. There are a couple of, a couple of other questions, but let's begin with, with, with these two. Mr. Countryman, please. Okay, <clears throat> I saw many good questions and there's not enough time to answer all, but let me try on these first two. First, uh, the accusations I make against the Republican Party, you can read every day in US newspapers. There is no Republican politician who is standing up to contradict what the president says about election fraud and why the election fraud, which occurs in about one case out of 10,000, is a reason to disqualify millions of voters from voting. So let's go through them really quickly because this could be a whole hour about what the Republican Party, uh, which has become nothing but an instrument of Mr. Trump, I think they are more similar to the United Russia Party under Putin than they are to any democratic party in Europe. Um, free elections, that means no intimidation. President Trump has encouraged his supporters to be at the polls to prevent election fraud. And in the United States, in many states where I'm going tomorrow, Pennsylvania, it is legal to carry guns in public uh, we expect that there will be efforts in some places for Trump supporters simply to show up and carry their guns and try to scare off voters who may otherwise be leaning towards Biden. Uh, they should be transparent and nonpartisan. The, Trump, the Republican Party, supported by the president and without a word of criticism from any Republican politician, has filed lawsuits in more than 12 states to throw out ballots that have been received by mail uh, because they expect that the majority of those votes received by mail are going to be for Democrats. Uh, there's always some argument uh, about counting individual ballots or about the process that was observed in this state or in this county but there has never been a national effort in advance of the election to deny hundreds of thousands of voters from getting their votes counted. Uh, most importantly, I think election results need to be respected. Every US president and every US candidate in the past has said, if the people vote against me, of course, I will leave office. Mr. Trump refuses to say this. He says he will accept the results if he wins, and if he loses, it must be because of fraud. It is uh, rather similar to the approach of Slobodan Milosevic in 2000. Um, and no Republican politician is standing up to disagree with him on this. And finally, they have to be safe. The reason that so many people voted by mail this year is because of the pandemic. And people have not been leaving their houses for many reasons, uh, and they don't wanna go stand in line to vote. So every state made it easier to vote by mail. And now the Trump administration and the Republican party are doing their utmost to make sure those votes cast by mail are not counted wherever they have the slightest legal argument to do so. And finally, elections have to be non-violent, both elections and the aftermath. 
the president and his sons have repeatedly called upon their supporters to be ready to defend the presidency. It is a Mussolini kind of tactic. And when in just in the last two days, uh, Trump supporters have organized big blockades of trucks and cars to prevent campaign events for Democrats, Mr. Trump has praised this as being patriotic. So I think there are, there's ample evidence of the massive Republican cheating campaign this year. On the question of what's more important for Serbia, is it the fight against corruption or is it territorial integrity? I gave my opinion, but I don't vote in Serbia. And people who have to vote in Serbia have to make their choice, what they care about most. That's the same in the United States. I look at friends whose number one issue in the United States election is making the abortion law more restrictive. And they are willing to tolerate a more racist president if he will roll back abortion laws. I know others, uh, friends who are voting for Trump because they got big tax cuts. And the tax cuts went to people who are in the upper 2% of the income distribution. They'll vote again for Trump and they will overlook everything they don't like about Trump. So uh, people weigh different issues differently. Uh, but my point about Serbia would be if Serbia sees its future in the European Union, my opinion is they will not get to the European Union without a serious anti-corruption set of reforms. And they will not get there without some kind of agreement between Belgrade and Pristina. I do not assume that that will be harder to reach under Mr. Biden or that Mr. Biden will push in one direction or another. Um, finally, I would uh, note uh, a point that Ambassador Vujicic made that I wanted to endorse. Uh, the president doesn't think about the Balkans every day. Mr. Biden will think about it more than Mr. Trump did, but there is much more continuity than breaks in US policy in Europe from one administration to the next. Most of it is carried out by the State Department. What has been different in the Trump administration are not just a couple of differences on policy, the de-emphasis on human rights and anti-corruption everywhere in the world, not just in the Balkans, the transactional nature of his approach to the Balkans, these are different, but the other thing that is different and that I think would again be more normal in a Biden administration is instead of a special envoy uh, doing whatever he thinks is good for the president and then the next day telling the State Department what he's up to, there would be a more coordinated government approach to any policy towards the Balkans. And I think there will be more coordination between the US and the EU, as I said, not to impose a solution upon one side or the other, but instead to have a more functional process of dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Countryman. And uh, now I would like to ask one question, uh, to ask Professor Vujicic one question, which is as well raised by Mr. Vladimir Tserovic. So um, basically he asks you about your opinion, should Serbia stay on any side in this election, uh, having in mind that uh, the, I'm sorry, it seems that an internet connection is a bit unstable. Just a second. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Sorry for... Yeah, you can hear me now. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, what is your opinion about uh, should Serbia stay on any side in this election? Uh, I think that you have already answered it, but you might uh, you might add certain 
certain remarks about this question. And uh, I would I would also kindly ask you, Professor Vujicic, to uh, share with us your opinion about the question which uh, Mr. Countryman has already asked about the Kosovo issue. So, so what might be better for Serbia regarding the, 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 the potential for the resolving of Belgrade-Pristina dialogue for finding a final solution if Biden wins and if United States have a joint approach with the European Union? Well, uh, okay. Uh, the first question is easy. I don't think it's uh, it's our business to meddle in the American election in either way. <clears throat> There's no need for Serbia to endorse anybody. Uh, and generally speaking, first of all, we're a small country. We, we, we need to realize this. And secondly, you know, in the old days of diplomacy, this was just not done. It was not considered to be good manners. You know, you accept whoever the American people elect democratically, and that's it. Okay, that's period. So uh, I don't think any of this was necessary either in the 2016 election or this election. Uh, none of this uh, hoopla, we are rooting for, for Trump. Now I understand the Serbian people uh, like Trump, they would like anybody uh, who was not involved in the Clinton administration. So it's the politics of resentment. And I understand that there's plenty of reasons to be resentful, but I mean, that should not be a guide to policymakers. Okay, I understand that people feel that way, but this is what people who are statesmen should just avoid doing, okay? Um, secondly, on the Kosovo issue, well, look, uh, I think there was a fundamental mistake made by the United States on pushing the United Declaration of Independence of Kosovo the way it was done. I'm not saying anything on the status of Kosovo, whether it should be independent or not independent. It's, it's, this is not the issue that I'm talking about right now. I think the way it was done was not a very productive way to do it. I think it was pushed a little too far, too quickly. And I think now the United States has created a problem in Europe. And it's, it's you know, I was trying to tell him this when I now put this in my memoirs that, you know, oh, it's just an exceptional, it's a, it's a unique case. And I was trying to tell him, no, it's not a unique case because the rest of the world doesn't see it as a unique case. And this has turned out to be true. Okay. So it's created a problem. And it's the problem is the following. We have five states in Europe not recognizing Kosovo. Okay. Now, the only way for Kosovo to have any kind of European perspective is for some kind of deal between Serbia and Kosovo, not necessarily recognition. But if Serbia recognizes Kosovo, then obviously Spain uh, would say, well, okay, if you recognize it, we will do too. We're not doing it now because of Catalonia. So uh, you've created a problem, a longer term problem, which is what I was trying to, to uh, uh, convey to them when they were reached, trying to, things were moving in that direction. But obviously, I mean, things happen the way they happen. So now uh, it's in the ear, it's, it's, it's portrayed as, as in everybody's interest to get this comprehensive agreement. So A, Serbia can move on and Kosovo can move on. Now, the big question here is, and we have to decide this for ourselves, do we really wanna be part of the European Union? That's what we have to answer to ourselves and not just see it as a, a, a Disneyland for grown up people and the cash cow where we get money. It's whether, do we want to have a life like people in the European countries have? Meaning again, not necessarily Hungary or Poland for that matter at this, at this point in time, but the, you know, like I said, the old Europe in Brussels terms, the core countries of, Europe, of the European Union, that, that Europe, because Europe is not a, 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 a geography. Uh, it, it, when we talk about the European Union, Union is, union is um, Values, a state of mind. It's uh, it's it's uh, an ideal of, of a society. It's it's an image that we're trying to live up to. So, do we really want to do that or not? I mean, that's I think the fundamental question for all the peoples of the Western Balkans. And uh, just getting into the European Union might not be easy anymore because of the new methodology, because Macron I think has had it with Orban and people like that, and he does not going to allow this to happen again. And in fact, he's trying to make reform the European Union so he can take away money from Orban that he's spending any way he wants without any audit or any sanction from the European Union. So I think now we're in a much more difficult position to, uh, to go uh, down the road to the European Union. And we have to prove ourselves more than Bulgaria, Romania, or Hungary, any of these countries that are right now the way they are, that we deserve to be a member of that club if we really want to be a member of that club. But I think the way it's portrayed here, uh, unfortunately, with a lot of people is that somehow we're getting the short end of the stick. Somehow the European Union is pushing things on us. We want to be a member of that club. We're applying to that club. 
you need to meet their criteria. Just like if you want to uh, enter a, a good university, you have to meet their criteria. If you want to, anything, a bridge club, you have to, uh, uh, you know, a gentleman's club, you have to meet certain criteria. So that's the question. The real question is us. It's not about either Biden or America, your opinion. Thank you very much, Professor Vujic. Uh, I would like to ask one short question uh, uh, to Mr. Georgiev. So basically you have uh, mentioned uh, that uh, the United States preferred stability to democracy in the Western Balkans, generally speaking, uh, in the last years. But it seems that this trend was not only uh, during Trump's mandate. Uh, if we take into account that Mr. Biden had quite cordial relations with uh, Mr. Vucic and with the current Serbian government in the period when, according to the, um, uh, for example, uh, the, the indexes of democracy and of liberty, which are produced by Freedom House, uh, Serbia already started uh, its decrease in democracy and liberty. So 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, Biden had quite cordial relations with, with Serbian government at that time, and there were not too much criticism coming towards Serbia. Why do you think that actually, and do you think that, that Biden's uh, victory would change anything in that regard and that he would care more about democracy nowadays than he cared five uh, years ago? Unfortunately, I do not believe. That's why I said you know, that's, that's, that's the same thing. You know. they, they have their policy for the Western Balkans and they, they I don't know, they, they choose whatever they want to choose in terms of, of politics or who to support, how to act. You know, Mr. Tadic, uh, you can say whatever you want to say about him, you know, but he was a real Democrat and he was never, never, Called or or, to, or or he never been close to, to 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 White House or something like that, you know. Du during Obama's first mandate, you know, Mr. Biden was here in in Belgrade also, and he met first Mr. Shutanos, then Mr. Tadic, and, and we know that. But you know, they they were not interested in that. You know, it it was not the question. The question was always the same. You know, you should recognize Kosovo. Uh, this administration under Mr. Trump, they changed something. They said, maybe you should talk about that. Maybe you should have a dialogue about that. Maybe you should say, you should see what, what does it mean to recognize Kosovo? Maybe you should not recognize Kosovo. Maybe we can find some other solution for that. So that's 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 a difference, and 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 I I I don't think that you know something will 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 change it in that sense, especially if if uh, if Mr. Biden uh, become a, a president, maybe he'll he'll come and say, you have to recognize Kosovo. That's it. We we, we finished with with that in, in 2008. It is independent state. There is no place for any dialogue any conversations, any ne negotiations, you know, that's it, the, the thing is finished. So from Serbian pr perspective, if we say we want, we want to pres preserve our territorial uh, integrity, uh, Mr. Trump approach was better. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Georgiev. And uh, since we have a couple of minutes left, we had a lot of questions uh, left for most of them for Mr. Countryman. So we agreed that he will now answer uh, three questions. So the first one about Biden's video from 1990s. The second one about is Biden a socialist? And the third one about the postal voting. Uh, is it fair? And how is it actually conducted in the United States? So Mr. Countryman, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. There's great questions, and I'll do my best, although time is short. Let me do it in the opposite order. First, about postal voting. I have always voted back in the state where I was born, which is Washington State on the West Coast, where Seattle is. For the last 20 years, Washington State has done all elections by mail. You don't line up on election day. You automatically get your ballot you return it in a secure fashion, 
And after every election, they monitor, they uh, audit for any irregularities. And what they find is that about one case out of 10,000, there is some irregularity, somebody who should not have voted, but whose vote was counted. Uh, five states do this. All the other states this year greatly expanded postal voting because of the pandemic. What the president has said repeatedly is that this leads to massive fraud. What is his evidence for this? He said so. He heard it from somebody, a guy on the internet. Somebody tweeted it. There is zero evidence from any serious scholar that there is a fraud problem with mail-in voting. But the president knows that if he can call into question everything about the election, he never has to accept the fact that he has lost the election. And nothing is more important to Mr. Trump than never having to acknowledge that he failed, that he's a loser. Second question is about socialism. You need to understand the role of the word socialism in American politics. In the 1930s, when Franklin Roosevelt put unemployed people to work, when he required that electric wires be extended to every small town and farm in the United States, Republicans called that socialism. When the uh, President Truman integrated the military so that blacks and whites would serve together, Republicans called that socialism. When we built a national freeway and highway system, Republicans called that socialism. Social security, Medicare, voting rights, and healthcare. Whatever the issue is, if it is good for the majority of Americans but costs money, Republicans call it socialism. It is their favorite thing. I don't know about when you were kids, did your mother try to scare you with stories about Baba Yaga? This is the same damn thing. For Republicans, everything they don't like is socialism. And it works for them with a lot of voters. And it is easier to just call everything socialism rather than to come up with a plan. Again, Republicans, since the Health Care Act was passed in 2010, said we have a better plan and we will release it soon. And every month for 10 years, they have said we will have our Republican health care plan soon. Now, if your husband tells you every month he's going to clean the backyard and after 10 years he's never done it, you would conclude he's lying. And it is a lie. The Republicans have no plan for health care except to call the Democratic plan socialism. And that's getting less and less effective. Now, about the video of Biden in 1999, I just took a few seconds to watch the video. Uh, he said during the time of the NATO campaign against Serbia because of Serbian ethnic cleansing and killing in Kosovo, that we should march into Belgrade. I disagree. He shouldn't have said that. He was a politician giving an opinion, and I think it was a wrong opinion. The question is, is that relevant 21 years later? Are there, is there a new conflict in Kosovo that we should worry about? Is there a new campaign of ethnic cleansing being planned by anybody? I don't think so. I think it was a dumb thing to say 21 years ago. And uh, if there is anybody on this call who has never said a dumb thing, please raise your hand. But it also goes to a broader question about nationalism in the United States and in Serbia. One of the most distressing things that I heard when I would go to visit my wife's family in the late 80s and the early 90s in Belgrade was the readiness of people to define other Serbian citizens as anti-Serbian. That there was a readiness to say, if you do not agree on the most important patriotic issues such as Kosovo, you are actually a traitor. You are actually anti-Serbian. And this is very much 
the rhetoric that is used by Donald Trump in the United States. If you don't agree with him, you are fundamentally anti-American. This is the logic of nationalism, and this is the politics of demonization. It has its counterpart, of course, in all countries. But the other point I want to make about nationalism is how we look at each other. Uh, there is a tendency among some in Serbia to say that Biden is anti-Serbian and pro-Albanian. And some Albanians will say the same thing. That suits the politics. It does not fit the reality. There is no reason to expect that Biden or anyone else will be partial one way or another. I can tell you from the inside, that is not the way that American foreign policy works. You may interpret the results to say, we never had a chance. The US was always prejudiced against us, but that's not the reality of how it works. Uh, and I don't think it's terribly valuable for Serbia, well, first, it's certainly true, as the ambassador said, there's no good reason for Serbia to endorse or support anybody in this US election. But I think it's also uh, unfortunate that there are folks in Serbia who define Serbia as being anti-American and therefore more ready to embrace assumptions that America will always be anti-Serb and pro-Albanian. Uh, that, if it makes you feel good, if it warms your heart, you can believe what you want. You can be as nationalist as you want. It will not help you in dealing with the United States or with any other country to automatically put people into categories as being enemies or friends. You got to deal with them as they are. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Countryman. Since we are running out of time, I have uh, two just brief questions. I would kindly ask um, panelists to give a 30 seconds long answer on them. The first one is for, for the rest of the panelists. The first one is for Mr. Vujicic. Uh, Mr. Vujicic, who would you bet on in today's election? Uh, who do you think that will win, Biden or Trump? I think there's, uh, there's, no, there's no chance that Trump would win. Uh, practically, uh, you know, like, he has a less than a 10% chance of winning this election, according to the polls, which are much different than the ones that were done under Hillary Clinton uh, election. Uh, but the big question now is what's going to happen on the night of the election? I mean, is he going to concede or is he going to drag things out or will there be conflict? And I think this is the drama of this election. If it was a regular election, he, uh, Biden would win hands down without a problem. The problem is the, the COVID, the post, uh, the uh, Voting through the through the post office and, and through, through the uh, envelopes and and and, and vo votes in advance, the counting of those votes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if we see, for example, we'll see we'll see we'll see uh, tomorrow night. We'll see, for example, if Florida goes to Biden, practically, then Trump is finished, no matter what what happens. Or if so, some of these states that are going to come up with a result that he's counting on don't deliver to him, then the election is going to be over, and I think there's not going to be much room for all this stuff. But if things are, uh, stay up in the air, then we're going to be facing a drama. Thank you very much, Professor Vujicic and uh, Mr. Georgiev. Uh, regardless of the outcome of the elections, do you think that it is possible to achieve a deal between Belgrade and Pristina in the next year, in 2021? No, no, I, I don't think so. That they will, uh, they, they, that we're going to have that. Nevertheless, we. I think that it looks like something is going to happen in next year uh, until this Mr. Lajček is finishing his term in April or May or something like that. But I, I, I don't believe in that. There is no, there is no will to, to finish it. Why should they? So I don't believe that. Thank you very much, Mr. Georgiev. And I would like to one more time thank, uh, say one, one big thank to all of the panelists. Uh, at our today's panel discussion. It was my, my, my sincere pleasure and honor to uh, talk to you and uh, to moderate this discussion. We had 
two or three questions left, although I think that even them, two questions left, even them we have addressed through answering on uh, other questions. So I hope that all of our attendees are satisfied with the answers that they have received. We haven't had enough time to touch upon other important questions such as the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republika Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and what is the Serbian interest in Bosnia and Herzegovina and how the Biden's administration, if he wins, would differ in this issue in comparison to Trump's administration and other open issues uh, which might be interesting uh, for this discussion. But uh, we will have another discussion on this topic Topic, uh, in the late November. So please follow us on social media. And uh, I hope that you will attend the second uh, panel discussion as well and that you will have great questions as you had today. Uh, one more time, great thank to Mr. Countryman, Mr. Vujicic and Mr. Georgiev. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.